Well, thanks everyone for coming to this presentation on Beyond the GPL. Um, this MIT license, all the things, this is a friend of mine when he saw I was presenting on this. He sent me a message on t Twitter and that was the title he said I should have called this because he knows that I am a kind of an MIT license fan. Um, I'd like to, I'm curious to know, we're, we're a small group so we can be a little bit less formal about this. Um, what kind of stuff are you guys hoping to get from this? Um, are, are some of you getting nervous that I'm going to start bashing the GPL already because we've just gotten to the title slide or what are you looking for? So I, I'm kind of a, I've been around open source for a long time, mm -hmm. 15, 16 years, 17 mm -hmm. years ago. But I've started working for a company who is just kind of waking up to it. Mm -hmm. And and, and I, I'm not a, I'm, I've used lots of open source stuff, but I'm by no means a license expert. So mm -hmm. I, I, my boss gives me questions once in a while that I don't know that I know the answer to. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see if I can help with that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I, well, I teach uh, classes, IT classes here at UVU. Mm. And so I want to be able to explain a little bit better and help the students understand what open source is and the licensing. And so the, the title of it was interesting. Okay, kind great. Of a, looking at where it's going, not so much where it's been. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we can help with that. Kind of like to know what some of the key points um, that make each license different, both as a consumer of open source, but also as a producer of open source. Okay. So, you know, if I decide to open source some software, what are some benefits for using different licenses or okay. consuming? What do I need to be aware of? Okay, we'll, we'll sort of touch on that. Um, I realized when I, I, I wanted to ask this question because I, when I put my license up, and I, one thing I've learned, by the way, this week is that I really, really suck at writing uh, synopses for my presentations. You know, I look at the ones that are in the book, and there's people that have these nice paragraphs, and they make their presentations sound really awesome, and mine really suck. And so that's something that I'll get, try to get better at. Um, I'm going to tell a little story about this. Um, that's what, kind of what this presentation is going to be about. Let's see if I can get my clicker to work. So before we get much deeper into this, what I am not is a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm, I do have some experience with this. You'll hear that in the story. Um, if you want legal advice, you're going to have to talk to someone else. You cannot use my presentation in, as a legal defense, um, but I'm going to talk about some goals. So when we have an open source project and we're licensing our project, we're thinking about this new project that we want to create, I think these are kind of the things that we think about. Um, you know, I've got this, this balance that I'm trying to strike on my open source project. On the one hand, I want to have you know, the reason why I'm even opening my source code at all is because I want people to use my stuff, right? I want, I want people to download it, I want them to play around with it, I want them to give me feedback, I want them to contribute, I want them to contribute code, I want them to, to um, tell me about their usage of it. The, there's another thing, though, which is that there's some degree to which I'm in, concerned about people taking advantage of my good nature, right? And that's why open source licenses were created. That's why we don't just put stuff out in the public domain. Now, you know, the public domain means there's no licensing at, at all associated with it. Um, the, the author has given up copyright law, and their, their copyright rights for that. And, and we don't want that, so we want people to, you know, there's this, this thing here about we want people to not take advantage of our good nature. So. I'm going to talk about working at this place. So I worked there for quite a while. I don't work there now. I just got, I couldn't handle the discouragement anymore. You know, it was, it was more than I could take. But uh, about 10 years ago, I was working there at a place, a, a division called uh, Developer Services. That group doesn't exist anymore, but uh, Back then, the group's responsibility was to help third-party developers write code 
for Novell's products. And uh, I, uh, one of the first things that I did for that group was to, um, I was working on uh, helping developers write software for eDirectory, which maybe most of you don't even know what that is, but it was like a directory before OpenLDAP and stuff like that, an active directory. It was, it's pretty good, but no one uses it anymore. But I, was, I, I wanted to figure out how developers would use that. So I went out to Novell's developer website and I found the SDKs and I downloaded it and found the tutorial and went through the tutorial step by step and I got about three quarters of the way through and I got stuck. And what I was doing on the tutorial just didn't seem to be working at all. I couldn't get my code to work. And finally I start asking around to my coworkers and one of my coworkers said, oh, why are you using that SDK? And I said, well, that's the SDK the tutorial told me to use. Oh, that one's broken. Don't use that one. Why are you following that tutorial? Well, that's our, that's our tutorial for how you use eDirectory. Oh, don't, don't follow that tutorial. It's, it's wrong. It's out of date. Use this other SDK that we don't talk about and use this other way to do things that nobody knows about. And, and I said, well, why are we trying to teach people to use eDirectory with materials that are out of date. And they said, oh, it's too much hassle to update our website. It's like three month turnaround. You submit an article, like a tutorial, and it would take three months of approval process. And so I just said, oh, that's, that's broken. You know, we got to fix that. So I started putting together some ideas for what we were going to do to fix that. Now at the same time, we noticed an interesting phenomenon. The way that we would communicate primarily with our developer group was through news groups. You guys remember news groups a long time ago? We don't even use them anymore. But that's how we would do it. And, and uh, we noticed something interesting on these news groups that our, the third party developers that were using our products were sharing code with each other. Um, now, I, I understand open source. I've used open source for a long, long time like you. I've, I started doing software development professionally um, 18 years ago, and we used GCC, and I've read Cat B 15 years ago at least. And so I'm real familiar with that, and that's what we saw is, hey, these guys are doing open source, and we need to create a new website. You know, this is kind of this confluence of things. We need to create a new website where we can collaborate with them, where we can release materials, where we can get our ideas in front of them, where our, this, this guy at this company can share his code easily with this guy at this company. And that was the idea that was percolating in my mind that I took to my management and we created a website called Novell Forge that doesn't exist anymore because even though we created it, Novell couldn't quite figure out how we should use it, and they eventually shut it down. But that was something that I did. Now, um, I had a really interesting experience doing that. It was a lot of fun. I felt like I made a bit of an impact there. But I distinctly remember one meeting we had. We're sitting in this room um, with the, the legal team. Um, you know, like most of you, if you've got to, if you want to, if you're working for a company and you want to release open source, there might be a process that you have to go through to review with the legal team. This was actually not Novell's first foray into open source. We had a, a friend of mine that works at Novell is a committer on Apache. He ported Apache to NetWare. They knew about this kind of stuff. And so we're sitting in this room and I'm talking to these lawyers and they are, they said this thing that I thought was kind of amazing. They said, um, they said to me, you realize that if you work on this, so back up a little bit, we were going to use an open source CMS frameworks called, CMS framework called Zoops. Um, can, this, this is 10 years ago. And in particular, there was a module for that called Zoops Forge that kind of did a source forge type clone. We were going to build on that. They were both GPL licensed. Uh, we considered GNU Savannah, we considered uh, an old snapshot of SourceForge. They didn't, their newer stuff was relicensed and you couldn't get the newer stuff. But uh, we decided to settle on this one. And so we're going to use this GPL stuff. We 
and it, our intention was to work on it and contribute back if we could. Um, these were GPL2. We were going to put it on the web, so we technically didn't need to contribute them back, but we wanted to do that, and uh, that's what, that was our plan. And the so the lawyers, they're telling us, they told me, you realize that if you work on this, you may not be able to work on future, you may disqualify yourself to work on future projects at Novell. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they said, well, there's this, you know, if we decided to do certain kinds of web-based projects, for example, you may not be able to work on those because of the fact that you worked on this. I said, what does that have to do with anything? And they said, well, you, you know, you're going to be tainted. You guys have probably heard that word before. You'll, you'll be tainted. And they said, because of the fact that you've, used the G, you've worked on the GPL stuff, this new stuff that you create or worked on could be considered a derivative work, and we may have to license it as GPL. And I, I remember looking at the lawyer, and I said, I said, that is not what the GPL means. That is not what open source is about. And he said, no, that's just not what most people think it means. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of interesting. You had a comment. I was just going to say that, that that was the gist of the SCO lawsuit. It's just what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly people right. People worked on one thing working on another, and they assumed that. Yeah. They were, they were amazing. I got to tell you, I know we kind of chuckle because they're lawyers and stuff like that, but those guys, they are, they're a great couple of guys. I had a good relationship with them. Um, but that really stuck out to me that, no, it's, that is what the license means because of how they interpret it legally. It's just not what most of us think it means because we understand what the goals of it are. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about copyright, because that's what he did. He explained to me, oh, let's talk about copyright law. Not a lot, but I'm going to try to br brush through this stuff. We know that open source licenses are copyright licenses, and so they are covered by copyright law. Now, how that applies to software is kind of weird, because copyright law covers implementation or expression of an idea, not the idea itself. That's what patents are. So we're, not, we're not protecting the idea, we're protecting an expression. And so he explained all this to me. And uh, the easy way to do that is to think about a book. So I picked a book that I'm sure that all of you have read. Um, we all love this book. No, we don't. I haven't read this book. But I know every part about it because it's been explained to me in exquisite detail. I probably could have read the book faster than the explanation. but. Thinking about a book, which we understand, and that's covered by copyright law, that makes it easy for us to understand copyright in general. So we're going to talk about derivative works first. If you go to, if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find this picture. This is a, actually in the public domain. Um, this is a, a, a canonical example of a derivative work. It's the Mona Lisa, but it's this particular one was not created by da Vinci. This has got a you know, Mona Lisa there with a little mustache and a goatee. Um, that's, this is an example of a derivative work. So here is the definition from the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office of a derivative work. Now, when you start to read this, then you are going to start to get an idea of why Novell's legal team was concerned. So look at the italicized parts here. Look at what I've, what I've uh, um, italicized here. Um, this is, keep in mind, this is the definition that the Copyright Office has settled on. This is what they distribute to people, okay? It must be different enough from the original. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Um, it must contain a substantial amount of new material. I, I don't understand even what that, what that means. I mean, this is pretty vague, and that's what these guys were telling me, is this is it's unclear how to determine whether it's a derivative work or not. So here's kind of our continuum, right? On the, on the left, we've got something here that says, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that book, I'm going to photocopy every page, I'm going to put it in a, in a black bound, hardbound cover, I'm going to put two white hands holding a red pomegranate like this, I'm going to call it Twilight, and then I'm going to sell this 
I think we would probably all agree that that's a derivative work and probably a copyright violation, right? And it, so we understand a derivative work is a copyright violation if the licensor doesn't, if the, if it, if, if the distribution of that derivative work is against the copyright wishes, or the license wishes. Does that make sense? So just because something is a derivative work doesn't make it a violation, but in the case of Twilight that would because she, you know, that's how she makes her money. She doesn't want me selling books that look just like hers and making all the money. So that I think we would clearly agree is a copyright violation. Over here we've got, for heaven's sake, please write something else besides mopey teenage girls and vampires and that's probably not a derivative work because it's a post-apocalyptic fiction. Anyway. Well, to go with that example, if you look at Fifty Shades of Grey, it's originally a Twilight fan fiction that they just changed the names of the people and sold it as Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. And so it's originally based on Twilight, but it's a derivative work, and then they changed the names, and so now it's completely separate. Yeah, okay, good. So, so it's different it's enough that it's well, okay, but that, that's kind of what I'm going to get to here. So we have, we have a continuum here, continuum here, right? I agree with you, um, but who makes that decision, right? So we have kind of a continuum here. So what happens if I, and this is what I want you to think about, is where do you guys think the line is drawn? Hopefully we have enough people to have a different opinion. So where is the line drawn? So here I'm going to, I'm going to write a book that is, it is exactly Twilight, except instead of, Edward, I'm going to call him Frank, and instead of Bella, I'm going to call her Claire or something, you know, just do a one character Caesar shift for every name, and they still are going to live in Forks, Washington, or whatever. I'm kind of making myself embarrassed because I know so much about Twilight. <laughs> um, so I've just changed all the proper nouns. It's the same story. It's, it's not as much the same as this, but is it still a derivative work? What if I do this? Um, it's the same basic idea, but instead of a, a vampire, now she falls in love with a zombie. So. That's, called, that's the movie Warm Bodies. Yep. Okay, okay, see? <laughs> you guys can take over the uh, embarrassing part. Okay, so. All right. Uh, we can make a story about a girl that moves to a new town, and, she falls in, and her name is Bella, and she falls in love with Edward, and it, maybe it makes references to Twilight, but it's really not a vampire story at all. Um, we can make a story that uses the same basic plot but changes almost all the story elements. And this actually happens all the time. I don't know how many of you guys ever saw the movie Clueless. I'm really embarrassing myself here. <laughs> anyone, anyone see that movie? It's actually pretty funny. Yeah. Clueless is uh, Jane Austen's Emma. It is the same story but they change the setting and changed the names of the characters, but it is the exact same story. Yeah, another example, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You is a retelling of Tending the Shrew. Okay. Well, and, and obviously it's in the public domain, but Shakespeare has been done and done and done. Yeah, and, done. This, this, and this, this, happens, this happens all the time. I mean, there's this theory that there's only seven basic plots. and So anyway, um, where do you guys think where, which of these is a derivative work and which one's not? Go ahead. It depends on exactly how, how where the individual case falls. Because you can create a story about an vampire couple called about Edward and Bella, and Bella that is closer to a straight photocopy than something else. So you can, okay. you can make a lot, you can make a very, an obviously derivative work that isn't based around vampires. Anyone have a different point? Everyone's, anyone secretly? Okay, but maybe you guys are the jury. It's a stupid story. Okay, <laughs> you you guys you guys could be in the jury, right? I mean, that's that's not all of these court cases would go to a jury, but they could. So you guys might be in the jury. I mean, can you imagine being in the jury and the story is somewhere around here? And you're trying to decide, well, is this a derivative work or not? And Stephanie Meyer's freaking out because she's gonna, she thinks she's going to lose. She's not going to be a billionaire. She's just going to be a multimillionaire or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, I, think, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that 
you know, we're a bunch of intelligent people. We kind of get what books are about, and we are not exactly sure where it becomes not a derivative work anymore. Okay, so here's a couple of other things about derivative works. Now we're, we're, we're it seems like we're off topic, but this is all coming back to uh, GPL licensed software and stuff like that. Um, you do not have to have the original work present to create a derivative work. So here we got this kid copying off of his neighbor. You do not have to have the be referencing the original at the time the copy is or the derivative work is made for it to be a derivative work. That's what they told me. Um, you do not have to consciously create the derivative work. Anyone here ever seen you ever experience this where you're going through Netflix or back when Blockbuster existed and you'd go walk through Blockbuster and you'd see a movie and you'd think, wait a minute, I, I saw that movie before. And you, you, you had seen it and it completely, it was completely forgettable. You had, it was completely out of your consciousness until you saw it on TV or something like that and you remembered that you'd seen it before. That happens to me a lot. Maybe it's just me. And the point I want to make with that is, if I've seen that movie, I can create a derivative work from it that could qualify as a derivative work without remembering that I've actually seen it. I can do it subconsciously. The thing I've noticed on Netflix is that whenever there's a, a fairly big movie, if you go on Blockbuster, you will find a movie that, a new movie that's the same the, the mm -hmm. one, I don't know why, but the one that's come to my mind is Battleship. Mm -hmm. there, was a show, there was a movie about a year ago called Battleship that was a big budget. But if you go on Netflix, there's another Battleship that was made in the last year that yeah. is right in there. Yeah. Uh, last one. Time is not really relevant. I mean, is you, you don't have to have access to the original work and then within some short period of time, you know, three or six months. It could be 10 years that goes by. So you can combine all those things together. Now you can kind of see why Novell's legal team was letting me know that. They're saying, if you look at this code that is GPO licensed code, 10 years from now, working for us, without even referencing that original code, you still could be doing something that would be considered a derivative work. Okay? Now, when they explain that to me, and what, you know, we know what copyleft means. We know, you know, now we can understand a little bit why they were concerned because copyleft is saying that if we do that, I am required to redistribute. If I'm going to redistribute, if I'm going to distribute at all, if it's a derivative work, I'm required to do it according to the original copyright terms. So let's go to our continuum again. We'll use some typical examples. Okay, over here, I'm going to take all the Linux sources. I'm going to post them all to my own GitHub. And I'm not going to call it Linux. I'm going to just change the name. Um, that's probably a derivative work. Okay, over here is I created something completely original that's never been seen before. That's pretty much guaranteed to not be a derivative work. But all along in here, we've got you know, a bunch of varying ways that this could be done. You know, I, I, I took Linux, but I renamed all the files, functions, and variables. Or I added some new features to an existing open source app, right? I, I took something that I like, but I added two or three new features to it. That's probably still a derivative work. Um, over here, I have my own software, but I used open source to add a feature. Well, is that a derivative work? Some would say that it is. Um, over here, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm doing it by executing that application through the shell. One thing that the lawyers told me is sometimes it depends on whether my software will run with that, with that included or not. But I don't know. Um, so here's, here's let's, we'll think about this slide as, uh, I, I have to go through my, all my transitions again. We'll think about this slide as, we're looking at the next one. So, you know, remember the last, the last continuum, we had a hard time figuring out where on that continuum we crossed the line. And we're smart people, okay? Um, my wife is really smart, but she's not a programmer. So I showed her this. 
I said, tell me if you think these are, I showed her the definition of derivative work, and I told her, look at these two and tell me if you think that these are substantially similar, and she said, yes, they are. Now, she's a smart person, she's not a programmer. So she looks at these two and she thinks, hey, those look like they're almost exactly the same. We're programmers. We can clearly see that they're accessing different databases, the schemas are different, we're printing different information, and we're just using metaphors that are common to programming, right? But a lay person doesn't get it, and when you are, if you're ever being tried for whether it's a derivative work, who's going to be making that determination? Probably not a programmer. So how are you going to be able to convince people who don't understand code, whether it's a derivative work or not, if we have a hard time figuring that out for books and we're smart? Right? That's the problem. That's why software companies are scared to death of copyright. I used to work at Microsoft, which, you know, is not really an open source company. Um, I, even, I, I was even surprised though at their policy. Do you know that if you work at Microsoft, it is against policy to download a binary of a GPL licensed piece of software? To download the binary is against policy. And it's not because they hate open source. It's because they're scared to death of what's going to happen, right? So to give you an example, I actually broke the rule because I I downloaded Sigwin on my workstation and when I was working at Microsoft because I needed grep and I can't really live without it and there is no such thing on Windows, at least not without paying for it. And so I had Sigwin on my workstation. They're worried about somebody that you know worked on Bash or the Free Software Foundation seeing that enough people have downloaded Bash and that now they have PowerShell and thinking that maybe there might be stuff going on there and getting into a big lawsuit even if they were to win. That's what they're afraid of. Software companies like Novell who were, you know, and are, I guess, I don't know what they're doing now, but soft Novell was a pro open source company. But they were still worried about this kind of stuff because they also are doing non-open source and they don't want to deal with that issue. Even if I never work on that other thing, but they know that somebody at Novell looked at this open source stuff, they don't even want to have to deal with that. Can you understand why software companies are afraid of this? It's not because they don't like open source. It's not because they don't like the GPL. It's because they don't trust the legal system and copyright law with its vague definition of what a, a derivative work is to protect them when they are trying to use it, even if they're trying to use it the right way. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. So, um, kind of as an interesting side note to this, uh, you know, I, I went through all of this and I was I'm uh, kind of worried about it. Um, so, I had a, this was 10 years ago, like I said, I had some time to think about it. Then in 2006, I went to EclipseCon, and um, Greg Stein was there speaking. Anyone know who Greg, Greg Stein is? Has heard of him? He is one of the, I think he is now the vice chairman of the Apache Foundation. And he was one of the main contributors to Apache, one of the primary committers on that project. He was on the board of directors at the Apache Software Foundation at, at the time. And he was there doing a keynote. And it was, it was a great talk. If you ever get to see him, you should go. Plus, he has this really long hair, and he, looks, he literally looks like a rock star. So, you know, he's not just an open source rock star, but he actually looks like one. But he put up this little... Uh, it was something like this, probably not, um, my slide is probably not nearly uh, as nice as his was or his delivery, but uh, um, he was explaining to the audience that he foresaw a movement in this direction um, from proprietary through copyleft to non-copyleft saying that this is the more restrictive and this is the more free. Now that's what he said. and. Um, it was pretty gutsy to do it because he was in front of the Eclipse crowd 
Anyone know the nature of the Eclipse licenses? The EPL and the CPL, they used one and then the other. I don't remember in which order. They're hardly any different. Are they copyleft or non-copyleft, do you know? They're copyleft. You know, they're they're kind of like the GPL. They are, amazingly, they're actually more verbose. Um, but you know, here he is standing in front of all these people, telling them um, this is the way. This is the wave of the future. Now, since that time, this is what I've been seeing a lot. Though, have you guys noticed this over over the last few years? You're starting to see more and more things that are being licensed BSD, more and more things that are being licensed MIT, more and more things that are being licensed with the Apache license or Zlib PNG license or different ones like that. That are non-copyleft because they, they don't require me to, if I create a derivative work, they don't require me to distribute that according to the same license terms. I can use it however I want. So that was something that he kind of identified and which I thought was kind of interesting. I've kind of seen that play out since 2006 when he first said it, or at least the first time I heard him say it. So this is kind of the concept I think he was trying to put forth is, you know, open source licenses are, are licenses of freedom, but for whom? Um, on copyleft licenses, if you're the creator of that, ori of that original work, there's a lot of freedom for you. You are free to, you're free from people taking advantage of your stuff. You're free to benefit from subsequent contributions. You're free to benefit from anything that people add to your original work. The people who are using your stuff are giving up a little bit of their freedom. It's not necessarily bad, but they're giving up the freedom to choose how their contribution is going to be licensed and used in the future. Right? They, they can't decide to put it into a proprietary, commercially licensed product. And they can't decide to put it into a MIT or BSD licensed product. It's going to be GPL licensed if it's a derivative work. Now on the other side of this is if you're doing non-copyleft, uh, if, if you choose MIT, then the freedom that is being preserved is that of the people who follow you, right? They are free to use your software however they would like. And me as the creator of that original work, I'm giving up a little bit of freedom. It's my choice. But the freedom that I'm giving up is the freedom to know that if, I, if you create a derivative work, that I'm going to be able to benefit from that. I might not. I'm making that as a conscious choice. So not necessarily one better than the other, but when it comes to derivative works, this is kind of the trade-off that you make. And so to kind of nail this down, I wanted to go through this last bit here. Why do we even use and contribute to open source software at all? Um, these are some of the reasons why I think people contribute to open source, right? They, they believe in the value of this community. Well, I think this is why we do it. I think we, we see the value of an open source community and we, we believe in that. We believe the phrase that Eric Raymond said that given enough, or maybe it was Linus Torvalds. It's, I looked on the internet and it was attributed to both of them. So, But I first read this in Cat B. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So there's value in that, right? That if we release our software out of the open source community, other people are going to look at it and make it better. Um, like, like this says, broad participation creates better software. Um, why, if I download or am I using open source in, our, in my company, which we do, if I patch it, why do I contribute my patch back? Because I don't want to maintain that patch. I would prefer to have the community incorporate that patch into the main line. And then when the next release comes out, my patch is in there. And I don't have to... I don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's a main, re a big reason why we contribute to open source software. It has a focus on creating more value, and you know we believe in karma, right? You do good things, and good things come to you. And I haven't put up here anywhere because I was forced to. Until now, I mean, do people really contribute to open source because the license makes them do that? I think they may be used to. This is, this is something I've thought about a lot. If, I, if I'm going to create an open source project and I'm going to choose the GPL, 
I pick on the GPL because it's popular, the most popular by far, most popular copy left one. If I'm going to choose the GPL, am I doing that exclusively because I want to make people contribute back? Do you really think that if some software company really wants to use your stuff, that if they weren't going to contribute back for all of these other reasons, that the, because the license says to contribute back, that they're going to relent and, and do that? They're either going to or they're not. They, they either get open source by now or they don't. Um, I just don't think that that is going to make that much of a difference anymore. But what you might do by licensing at GPL is make it so that they don't even download it at all. Just stay completely away from it. So, um, you know, like I said, I started using open source back in the mid 90s. I think it was essential for the success of open source. I don't think we would be where we were today without copyleft licenses, and particularly the GPL. I think it was crucial for us to get where we are. Um, I don't think we could have gotten enough people getting their mind right about it if we hadn't done it. I'm not sure it's that enforcement is still necessary today. I think there's enough people today that get it, that understand all those other reasons why open source is good, that I don't know that it's actually necessary anymore. Um, that's why at the beginning I had that, my friend tweeted back to me and with the suggested alternate title of MIT license all the things. He knows that that's how I feel. Um, for me, when I do open source, um, I choose non-copyleft licenses, usually the MIT license. It's very, very open and free because I would rather have people participate and not let people worry about participating rather than, rather than, uh, and, and I'm willing to give up a little bit of my my freedom to do that. So here's some reasons to stick with a copyleft license. Um, you legally want to require fair participation. Um, lots, lots of software companies will do this. Open source companies in particular will do this a lot. If they're working on something, they want to make sure that their competitors don't leverage their work against them in a proprietary product and take advantage of all of their contributions, then they'll GPL license it. And that makes it so that you know everyone gets to play on a fair playing field. Um, interesting thing with with Novell, by the way, um, they they would prefer at the time when I worked there, they would prefer to if they were creating a new product and they wanted to use open source from the community, they would prefer MIT or BSD license. But if they were licensing their own stuff for open source for other people to use, they would choose GPL. Okay, so that's, I thought that was interesting. Um, if you're participating on projects that are already copyleft, then you're going to stick with copyleft. If you're an old school guy, I don't mean anything, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but if you are like uh, Richard Stallman, he, he firmly believes in the GPL, he understands it thoroughly, he believes in the value of it, he thinks that that uh, enforcing the copyleft restrictions or the freedoms, or however you want to spin that, that that's essential and fundamental to the success of open source, that's great. I, I disagree with, with him, but you know, I'm just me. You know. He's Richard Stallman, so if that's how you are. Now here's another reason why people use uh, copyleft licenses, I think, and it's because they're lazy. Uh, I, th I believe that lots of projects, I'm sure none of you in this room, I'm not talking to you guys, but I'm sure that lots of projects that are open source projects today were GPL licensed because it was the easiest thing. It was the most popular one to pick and they just didn't want to think about it. They just picked that license. They didn't know much about licenses. They didn't know about it. I, I mean, who can blame them? I mean, it's not really like it's... You know, there's only like 15 of us in this room, so it's not super exciting to learn about. Um, I don't really blame them, but when you're, it's kind of hard to take it back though, right? Once you release your project and people start contributing, it's kind of hard to take it back and say, oh, I changed my mind. I decided I want to MIT license it because all the people that have contributed up to that point are assuming that 
their stuff is going to be protected. You, it's kind of hard to change it. That's and an interesting story to add to that. The great. More recent, there's um, the Bootstrap Project is right in the middle of discussing. Right now, it's licensed under the Apache License 2.0, mm -hmm. but that's not compatible with GPL v2. Mm -hmm. It is compatible with v3. Mm -hmm. um, but there's all these open source CMSs like WordPress and Drupal that are GPL v2. Mm -hmm. And so you can't you, you can't legally use uh, Bootstrap for a WordPress theme or a or a Drupal theme um, because it's it's incompatible licenses. Yeah. And so they're in the middle of discussing uh, a migration to the MIT license. But there's so many contributors to Bootstrap right now. they they have gone through and done um, a survey of users and it was uh, I think the last time I saw the survey, it was like 200 people had responded. Um, they used the emails for the actual commits. Uh -huh. It was all on Git, so they had, they had email addresses for everyone. And I think they had 200 responses, and of those, um, like about 196, 197 of them were all for the move, and mm -hmm. three were, were against. And I think the reasons for those three were um, people following uh, uh, like uh, ESR can can be like we need yeah. GPL here. Yeah, yeah. They're they're thinking uh, these contributions I made in the past were with this assumption in mind, right? Yeah. And yeah, that's fascinating. Um, thanks for thanks for sharing that. I hadn't heard about that, but it's and, and that's an interesting example because um, a, the Apache license and the MIT license are actually fairly close in terms of their paradigm as compared to if you were trying to go from GPL to yeah, it, it's MIT still there. A license. Yeah. It just isn't GPL. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. Yeah. Thank you for saying for saying that. Um, so uh, here's some reasons to consider a non copy left one. This to me is I, I haven't done any interest, you know, super big or amazing open source things. So, you know, but uh, but this is why I prefer non copyleft licenses because I don't. I know from my experience at three or four different places how companies view this, and it all comes down to the fact that they don't trust average people, judges and juries, to make a good decision about whether something is actually a derivative work or not. So if it's MIT, they don't care. Most places, they will tell you if you are downloading it and it says MIT or it says BSD or you know they'll give you a list of a bunch of permissive licenses that are non-copy left and they'll tell you in their policy if it's in this list go knock yourself out. Do whatever you want. We don't care because they've already reviewed that. They don't, in fact they're their legal team is saying, please don't email me and ask if you can download Boost. You know, um, because it's they know the license is, is fine and they don't want to be bothered with people asking about that. So, uh, you know, or, or Mono, for example, that is MIT licensed. So it, it encourages participation by large software companies because they're not afraid of those non copyleft licenses. And the broader adoption means that you can get a larger community. You can get more eyes on your project. You can get more people contributing to it. The ones that aren't going to are the ones that are concerned about their work being abused by somebody that's going to take advantage of it f and exploit it. So those, you're going you're gonna to alienate some. But for me, when I make this decision, I prefer to feel like people can use my stuff however they want. That's just me. Um, and I think that a larger community means stronger code and, and I believe that people who understand open source are going to give back to it anyway and people who don't weren't going to in the first place. So I don't, personally, I don't feel like you're really buying that much. That's just me. Um, lots of other people have different opinions and I respect those. This is, this is just me. I just don't think that a license is going to force them to give back. So um, that's the end. This is me. Um, some of you had some questions. Did we get? Did we get to kind of what you were? Did we touch on what you were looking for? Is there more that you want to talk about? Any questions that we want to cover? Any, uh, are there any, are there any 
are there large differences between the BSD license and MIT? Oh, I was going to look that up before I came. Um, not really. I think the main difference. Okay, don't quote me on this. You can go. You can go to the op, you know the open source foundation and look. But I think the main difference is that BSD wants you to attribute. So you know if you use BSD code in your thing, then they want an attribution back that says you know parts of this are from this project and. I think with MIT, they just don't even care. I think, if I remember correctly, I think that's the main difference. But anyone know if I'm blowing smoke there? I mean, I am blowing smoke. I, th I think I could be right, but. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Okay. Some of you expressed things you were looking for when we came in. I'm not sure we got to the things you were looking for. Okay. What about you? I was, you were the one I was most worried about. Well, you may be kind of wanting to see a list of here's some yeah. copy left ones, here's some wrong. Yeah, and I, I don't want to reiterate, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that, I mean, I have my own personal opinion. Um, if you, if any, any time I open source stuff, it's probably going to be MIT. That's just, if it's my choice, that's what I'm going to choose. But that's no different than somebody who prefers GPL choosing that. And they understand what they, what the trade-offs are for them. That's fine. Um, and not, I'm not against the GPL, but I, I am concerned and have been for a while. That's why I did the presentation. I am concerned about people choosing that license and not understanding what the implications are. Or people, people being angry at their company for not letting them participate in GPL license code without understanding why, why their company doesn't, or why their company is concerned about that. Or, you know, even understanding why does, why I had this great project, my company won't contribute to it, I don't understand why that is. Well, it's because they aren't sure about what the license fee uh, terms are going to mean for them. If it's GPL, they're just, they're just scared. And there's not been a good legal precedent yet, a case that's gone to trial and sat before a jury to have, for people to decide how that is. And even if there was, I don't know how you would apply one case to the other. It's just so subjective. So. <laughs> Projects and there is a. I, I don't think I know a single developer that hasn't worked on a open source project of some kind at some point somewhere mm -hmm. uh, you, under a copyleft license. Pretty much everybody's team. Yeah. yeah I, that's what I'm saying. I think every last developer is technically tainted, and it doesn't really matter which company they're working for, they've worked on GPL code. And yeah. It's kind of an interesting. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And to me, even beyond that, I mean, I've I've worked at six or seven companies and on closed source stuff, and and I my experience builds on all of those, and so I, I learned I use tricks that I've learned everywhere, and I'm using stuff from three companies ago that was closed source, and what I'm doing now. Yeah. It also, it comes down to kind of a risk management kind of area, or no balance taking the stance that you know we're just going to go no risk. Mm -hmm. Just keep these things closed off here entirely. Well, look what it did for. I mean, I don't want to. I don't really want to defend SCO, but <laughs> but look what it did for them. I mean, they got embroiled in this big, massive lawsuit with IBM, and then Novell got involved, and Microsoft got involved, and um, I'm trying to remember if there was actually ever a resolution to that, or did they just run out of money? I mean. That's, that's kind of the thing, is that, and what did it do to their reputation? You know, I mean, the first version of Linux I ever installed was Caldera on my Pentium 100 back in like 1995 or 96. I mean, and, and Caldera became SCO. So Caldera, that, they were like my introduction to Linux. Yeah. 
back I then. I would say nuclear plants have a better, yeah. have a better reputation. <laughs> that's, that's exactly my point. Is, I mean, they kind of, they basically destroyed their entire reputation with that lawsuit. And I don't know if any of us actually know for a fact, maybe some of you worked there and would know, but I don't know if any of us actually know for a fact what kind of a case they had or not. But they ruined their reputation with it. And, you know, if Novell were to get, you know, imagine Novell trying back when they were doing this, I don't know what they're doing now, but imagine them back then, they released the Novell Forge, they do, they acquire Zimian, they acquire SUSE, they port all their stuff to Linux, they're trying to promote open source. Imagine if they had been sued for a GPL violation, it would have completely destroyed the entire company. So I can understand why even an open source company like them would have been concerned about that. And I mean, what would it do to Microsoft? Well, I mean, we can only hope, but. I, I applied for a job once at Caldera, and it's one of the jobs I'm just very glad I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. I have that same experience. <laughs> I do have a friend that used to work for Caldera way back in the day, a while before the scope mm -hmm. takeover. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions that I can answer for you? So anyway, that's me. Here's, uh, since we were talking about copyright indirectly, I just want to be sure you see that I have attributed all my pictures. That if you download my slides, you can click the links and go to the sources and see the licenses for every picture. So I was really worried about that. I didn't want to be, uh, be a hypocrite. So anyway, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.